Hi, my name is Mary Ann Suero, and I'm an environmental health scientist with the United States Environmental Protection Agency in the Midwest. I serve as the Children's Health Program Manager at Region 5, which includes the states of Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Thank you for letting my colleague and me be with you virtually today to talk about children's health and lead poisoning prevention. I know that once you know more about the devastating impacts of lead, the work that you do will have a positive impact on the health and well being of children. This is just our standard disclaimer, letting you know that if we send you to a link that's not from the US Environmental Protection Agency, it does not constitute an endorsement or a recommendation of that content. This webinar will be in two sections. In the first part, I'll talk about the consequences of lead exposure to individual children and to communities impacted by lead. In the second part, my colleague, Tony Martig, will talk about EPA's Lead Renovation, Repair, and Painting Rule, or RRP. More specifically, he'll talk about what it is who it applies to, and ways for do-it-yourselfers to protect their families from the harmful effects of lead. He'll also talk about what building departments can do to promote the use of lead-safe work practices, including RRP, as well as what EPA can do for you and for your community. So we're going to get started with the first part, and I call this, Why Should I Care About This Stuff? We all understand pretty much intuitively the idea of risk in our everyday lives. For example, if we try to cross a busy street where, where the cars and the buses and the trucks are speeding by, we risk getting hit by one of them. But if there's no traffic when we try to cross the street, we don't have a risk of getting hit by one of those vehicles. So in this example about the risk of getting hit by a car, Think of the traffic as being the hazard and thinking, think about walking into the street as the exposure to that hazard. The idea of risk as it relates to lead is very similar. In order for us to have a risk from lead, we have to have an exposure to lead. The best way to prevent health effects from lead then is to prevent exposure to lead. When we consider risk, we also have to consider risk to whom. And when it comes to, to lead, children are the most vulnerable because children are not little adults. I'm going to talk about three reasons that contribute to children's increased vulnerability to chemical contaminants. The first reason has to do with the fact that children, unlike adults, are growing, going through rapid growth and development. That rapid growth and development starts in the womb and ends when a child is fully mature, sometime between the ages of 18 and 25. When a child is exposed to a con chemical contaminant like lead, because his or her brain is growing and developing, that chemical has a greater opportunity of disrupting that growth and development. And once that happens, the child is less likely to reach his or her fullest potential as they grow. The second way in which children are different than adults and which leads to their increased vulnerability has to do with the ways in which their bodies act differently than adults' bodies. Pound for pound, children breathe more air than adults, drink more water than adults, and eat more food than adults do. So if there's some chemical contaminant like lead in the air or water or food, children are getting a bigger exposure to it. Also, children's systems to detoxify are not mature. When our bodies determine that there's a foreign material present, they're very efficient at getting rid of that foreign substance. 
Children's systems, however, are not so efficient. And that means that they're not as able to detoxify as rapidly as an adult's body might. That means the chemical contaminant stays around longer in the child's body, giving it more time to cause damage. The third way in which children are not just little adults has to do with their behaviors, including how they interact with their environments. Children touch things more frequently than adults and are more likely to put things in their mouths than adults. This is common behavior for a child, and in fact, it's the way young children learn. But because they're more likely to put their hands in their mouths or toys in their mouths, if these have some contaminant, like lead paint dust on them, a child will have a bigger exposure to that contaminant and therefore a greater risk from that chemical. So we have to consider these types of behaviors when we think about how to reduce children's lead exposures and prevent lead poisoning. So in summary, children are not little adults. And because they're not little adults, they tend to have larger exposures to chemicals in their environments, especially their indoor environments. And because they have larger exposures, they have greater risk from those contaminants. Even though average blood lead levels have dropped dramatically over the past 25 years, lead exposure continues to be a major health concern for children. What we know now is that lead is extremely toxic, especially to young children. We also know that there is no amount of lead that is safe for children. No amount of lead that is safe for children. Even low levels of lead in the blood of a child can lead to all sorts of health effects, like problems with behavior and learning, lowered IQ, hyperactivity. Children with large exposures to lead are less likely to graduate from high school than their less exposed peers. And that translates to their earning less money over their lifetime. And that in turn can mean that a community is less likely to have economic prosperity over the long run. Childhood lead poisoning is completely preventable by reducing or removing sources of lead from a child's environment. Lead exposure can lead to lifelong impacts on a child. Lead can cause damage to the developing brain and nervous system. It can lead to slowed growth and development, to learning and behavior problems, and problems with hearing and speech. Lead exposure can also contribute to lower IQ, intelligence quotient, in a child, as well as a child being less able to focus and pay attention in school ultimately leading to that child's underperformance in school. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, which is another federal agency, set a reference level at five micrograms of lead per deciliter of child's blood. But CDC has also said that no concentration of lead may be safe in a child's blood. What that means, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a cons consensus group of experts have agreed that even below that reference level, lead still contributes to poor academic achievement, to lower IQ, to attention deficit and behavior disorders in children. So what that means is that your school system and ultimately your community pays a huge cost for lead exposure, which is 100% preventable if we all play our parts. The effects of childhood lead exposure don't stop once the child has grown up. As a child who was exposed to lead grows to adulthood and then into older age, he or she may have reproductive problems as well as health effects like heart disease, 
high blood pressure, digestive problems, problems with memory and concentration. Some studies have even shown that men with lead exposure in early life are more likely to suffer from cataracts in older age. I mentioned earlier that average blood lead levels have dropped dramatically over the past 25 years, but that lead exposure continues to be a major health concern for children. This is especially true for poor children and for minority children. In the next few slides, I'm going to show you groups of data bars. In each group, the blue bars represent both black and white children together. The red bars represent white children only, and the green bars represent black children only. The first group represents children of all incomes. As you can see, the green bar representing black children is taller than the others in its group. This means that black children across the country tend to have higher blood lead levels than other children. The second group represents children whose families earn more than those whose families are poor. So they're the children who are not poor. You can see that the bars in this group are shorter than the bars in the first group. That means that wealthier children, no matter what race they are, are less likely to have an elevated blood lead level than their peers. This third group represents just poor children. When we look at just the second and third group of bars and compare blue to blue, or red to red, or green to green, we see that poor children in the third group are more likely to have an elevated blood lead level than their non-poor counterparts, no matter what their race. I like this graphic from Lead Safe Illinois from Loyola University in Chicago. It shows the cascading impact of lead on children and their community. So in the center, we see individual impacts on the child. And then as we move out to the lighter blue, we see the cost to the child's in individual children's futures. And then finally in the green, we see those same costs magnified out to the community level. In the end, the only way to prevent these impacts is by preventing lead exposure to children. So where can the lead be coming from? Well, if you live near an industrial source that emits lead, like a lead smelter, you might have some lead in the air that you breathe. Of course, we know that lead might be in the drinking water. And just as a reminder, only cold water should be used for drinking, for cooking, or for making baby formula. Some lead can also be found in toys and in jewelry. Lead can also be found in soil, left over from when lead is in gasoline, or from old deteriorated lead-based paint on the exterior of homes and other buildings. The major source of lead exposure for most children, however, is deteriorated lead-based paint in houses that were built before 1978. Friction surfaces like windows and doors are the main contributors to this fine dust, which spreads across the floors and window ledges. It may also be coming from deteriorated paint on walls, maybe after some damage to the wall, perhaps from water damage to the wall or maybe from some um, renovations that are taking place in the home. The older the home is, the more likely it is that it contains lead-based paint. As you can see here, nearly 90% of homes built before 1940 contain lead-based paint. Think about the homes in your community. While intact lead-based paint is not a hazard, if it's there, even under layers of other paint, once someone disturbs the paint, whether accidentally or on purpose, 
as happens during home repairs, that lead paint will start to chip, flake, chalk, and dust, and then there is a lead paint hazard. In a few minutes, you're going to hear about a newer regulation that's intended to help prevent children from being exposed to lead. But there's, there are several older rules out there with which you're hopefully already familiar. The first of these is the lead disclosure rule. This is a federal rule that is designed to inform people who are planning to rent an apartment or buy a home about the potential for lead-based paint and lead-based paint hazards that may exist in the housing built before 1978. Because of this disclosure law, landlords, property management companies, real estate agents, and sellers have to make sure that the person renting or buying the property has the information necessary to protect themselves and their families from lead-based paint hazards before going through with the rental or purchase agreement. Landlords, property management companies, and real estate agents must provide a copy of the lead hazard information pamphlet seen here, which is titled, Protect Your Family from Lead in Your Home. They also have to disclose knowledge about any lead-based paint or lead-based paint hazards and provide a specific lead warning statement. For home sales, the agent also has to provide an opportunity for the potential buyer so that they can have their home inspected for lead hazards if they choose. For more information about the lead disclosure rule, please see the website listed here, epa.gov slash lead slash real dash estate dash disclosure. Other regulations are in place to ensure that there is a well-trained workforce who can conduct lead inspections and lead risk assessments and also conduct lead abatement. Lead inspections and lead risk assessments are basically looking for lead in a specialized way and determining whether that amount of lead constitutes a risk to children. Lead inspections and lead risk assessments are useful first steps that help the homeowner or property manager make more thoughtful decisions related to the management of lead paint and lead hazards, lead paint hazards in their home. Abatement is an activity that is designed to permanently eliminate lead-based lead paint hazards. Sometimes abatement can be ordered by a state or local government, for example, in the home of a child with an elevated blood lead level. Lead abatement, including the certification of the lead inspector, risk assessor, and abatement professional workforce, is generally managed by the states. For more information about these, please see the website listed here. If you or your, any member of your community or healthcare providers or educators in your community have questions about children's exposures or health effects, there's a group of providers that are co-funded by us at US Environmental Protection Agency and another federal agency called the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. They're called Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Units. They're located in each of the 10 regions across the country that you see on the map here, and they serve as a resource, usually at no charge, to evaluate, treat, and prevent environmental illness in children. They also train pediatricians and others in environmental health issues, and they can promote children's environmental health in communities. You can find more about them, including the PESU, Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit, it, that's located in your region at www.pehsu.net. And for more information, you can also see our website, epa.gov lead, 
or the Centers for Disease Control's led website at www.cdc.gov slash nceh slash lead. We've come to the end of my session, but now we have time for a couple of check-in questions. So what we're going to do is the questions will come up, and if you uh, feel like you need to stop and pause the um, the video for to, to answer the question more thoroughly, please feel free to do so. Um, if you want to grab a piece of paper and a pencil, you can feel free to do that now. Again, you can always pause the, 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 um, the video. So the first qu uh, quick check-in is, after hearing the presentation, name three ways in which children are not little adults and which lead to their vulnerability to environmental contaminants. Hopefully you came up with at least some of these things. They have rapid, they have periods of rapid growth and development. Their bodies just don't work the same as adults because they're less mature and less able to detoxify than adults' bodies. And they also have those different behaviors that contribute to their increased exposures compared to adults. So hopefully you got those all right. Next check-in, name three major sources of lead exposure for children in the U.S. Again, if you need to stop and think about it, just feel free to pause the video for a few seconds. So deteriorated lead-based paint in houses built before 1978, that's a really major source of exposure. The legacy sources of lead in soil, like leaded gasoline, exterior leaded um, paint, and also in industrial sources that might be in your community from um, years ago. And also drinking water. Again, it's generally contaminated by plumbing and fixtures rather than by the water that's coming into your, into your home. So hopefully you got those three, paint, soil, drinking water. Those are the three biggies. Great. Let's move on to one more question before the second half of the training. Match the following to their correct description. Lead inspection and lead risk assessment and lead abatement. Which one is which? I think this one was pretty easy. Lead inspection and risk assessment are useful first steps to help home owners and, and landlords make more thoughtful decisions on managing their lead paint and lead hazards. And lead abatement is an activity designed to permanently eliminate lead-based paint hazards. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the second portion of this training Okay, thank you, Mary Ann. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Anton Martig, also known as Tony Martig, and I am the chief of the EPA Region 5 Toxic Section. The Toxic Section of EPA Region 5 includes the Lead Based Paint Program. Thank you all for joining our webinar. I'm going to talk about how local government building permit departments could take 
various approaches, if you haven't already, towards educating contractors about the dangers of lead poisoning and what is expected of contractors under the federal lead-based paint renovation rule. I'm also going to talk about how EPA can work with permitting offices in undertaking such efforts. This is important, not only because of the public health issues associated with lead-based paint, which Mary Ann just talked about, but also because there are still millions of homes with lead-based paint. I'm going to review some of the key points of the Federal Renovation, Repair and Painting Rule, which I may also refer to as the RRP or the Renovation Rule. The renovation rule was put into place to minimize lead hazards while renovation, repair, or painting work is going on. Some building departments have already begun to address the renovation rule in their permitting processes. I hope to demonstrate to you just how simple it can be to incorporate education on the lead-based paint renovation, uh, lead-safe work practices, and the RRP program or rule into various aspects of your daily activities and routines. With that, I will begin by talking about why the renovation or RRP rule is important. The bottom line is lead is unhealthy and, and can adversely affect nearly every organ and system in a person's body, both in children and adults. Marianne already discussed the harmful effects of lead, so I'm not going to repeat that. However, I want to emphasize a couple points. Considering the harmful effects of lead, one very important point that I would like to emphasize is that exposure to lead-based paint dust is preventable. Good cleaning practices and good lead-safe work practices used during renovation and repair projects can prevent all of these associated harms from ever occurring. Also, it does not take much lead to cause these harmful effects. For example, if you can picture a little sugar packet and the amount of sugar in that packet, it only takes about that same amount of lead dust to contaminate a home of about 1,500 square feet. And at that level of contamination, it is enough to raise a child's blood lead lead level to a point where permanent damage can be seen. Also imagine that if that amount of lead dust was spread evenly over 1,500 square feet of flooring, you may not even see it. The renovation or RRP rule was designed to help achieve the goal of making the exposure of lead dust preventable, at least during renovation, repair and painting work. I will talk about how the renovation rule aims to do this, but first I want to talk a little more about why this is important to you. Assuring that both the customer and the contractor know about the renovation rule or requirements results in benefits to both your departments and your communities. First of all, and most importantly, working lead safe protects public health, especially children, and safer work equals safer housing. In addition, it encourages quality work from contractors and levels the playing field, thereby improving industry standards. Our experience has shown that contractors with EPA, RRP or renovation certification often complain when they perceive that they are being underbid by uncertified contractors who are not using lead safe methods or following the renovation or RRP rule. So by requiring all contractors to use, to use the same work practices, such as the use of plastic to cover openings, floors, and furniture, it levels the playing field and promotes fair competition. Next, I'll talk about what types of building, things building departments can do to help. So where do you fit in? Building permit departments are the, at the critical planning point where homeowners and contractors agree about how renovations are to be performed. This decision checkpoint provides a perfect opportunity to educate all parties involved about the renovation rule. This is because one, 
your departments know the contractors or homeowners that come in to apply for building permits, and you also know the job sites. Two, the permitting process is otherwise already designed to address health and safety concerns. And third, you can use this knowledge and the permitting process to promote an understanding of the regulatory requirements before the work actually begins. Now, back to the renovation or RRP regulations. The Renovation Repair and Painting Rule or RRP rule was issued in, 19, in 2008. Now, the regulation was a product of two research studies. The first study showed that typical renovation activities that disturb lead-based paint produce hazardous quantities of lead dust. And there is a correlation between renovation work and elevated blood lead levels in exposed children. The second study confirmed that recommended dust control methods used during renovation, repair, and painting projects were effective in reducing lead paint hazards. The scope of the renovation or RRP rule is to address lead-based paint or dust hazards created by renovation, repair, and painting activities that disturb lead-based paint in two types of buildings, target housing and child-occupied facilities. Now for some important terms to help understand and apply the regulations. The word disturb and phrase disturb lead-based paint is used in that first line on the slide. Examples of disturbing include sanding, scraping, or removal of a painted surface. It does not mean washing or painting over. So if someone is just going to wash and paint a wall, the RRP rule does not apply. The first bullet on the slide uses the phrases target housing and child occupied facilities. Target housing is defined as any dwelling built prior to 1978 with a few exceptions, such as studio apartments, dormitories, or housing for the elderly where children do not typically reside. Child-occupied facilities are other non-residential facilities which were built before 1978 and that are frequented by children under six years old. And examples of these types of facilities are daycare centers, preschools, and kindergarten classrooms. Another important part of the rule is that, unless specifically known, for example, by testing the paint, a home built before 1978 is assumed to contain lead-based paint, and therefore all the uh, RRP or renovation rule requirements apply. The RRP or renovation rule also has a de minimis threshold or a minimum surface area standard, and the rule does not apply where a renovation project disturbs less than six square feet of painted service per room on the interior or less than 20 square feet on the exterior. For example, if a painter is going to repair a few small holes in a wall in a room before painting, the renovation rule or RRP rule does not apply. And any window replacement in a home built before 1978 is covered by the RRP, RRP rule, meaning the window replacement contractors and workers must be certified and must follow the renovation or RRP rule and the lead safe work practices. It is also important to note that regulated renovation activities are different from lead abatement. Lead abatement is defined more narrowly as a project to permanently eliminate lead hazards from a building as specifically stated in a contract. It is also generally required by a state or local health department when a child is found to have an elevated blood lead level. Abatement requires more training and different certifications and the use of more specific procedures to confirm that the abatement work is complete. So where does the RRP rule apply to, or what does the RRP rule apply to? The renovation or RRP rule applies to anyone who performs or offers to perform 
lead-based paint renovation and repair work for compensation in pre-1978 housing or child-occupied facilities. The term compensation includes any pay for work performed, such as pay by contractors or subcontractors or work conducted by contractors or subcontractors. And this may include a local handyman if that handyman accepts any compensation. Compensation also covers wages, such as those being paid to building owners, agents of property management companies, child care facility operators, and persons working for nonprofit organizations if they are doing the renovation. In the case of landlords, any rent, rent paid for the use of the housing would be considered compensation. Therefore, if a landlord, landlord does the work themselves, they are subject to the RRP or renovation regulations and must be trained and certified. If a landlord hires a contractor to do the work, the contractor must be certified and the workers trained and certified. For projects covered by the renovation rule, the firm or business, including contractors or subcontractors doing the work must be EPA certified. And the workers, or at least one worker per job site, must be certified. The workers obtain their certification only after taking a training course. The training course is eight hours the first time they take it. And then they only have to take a four hour refresher course every three or five years, depending on the type of initial course they took uh, to keep their certification. The exceptions to who is covered by the rule is do-it-yourselfers or persons directly performing renovation work in housing they both own and occupy, and persons or contractors performing renovation or repairs on post-1978 housing or structures. These, are sub these exceptions are not subject to the rule. However, for any work in a, in a house built before 1978, we strongly recommend that the homeowner consider hiring a certified contractor instead of doing the work themselves. And if that is not a, not a possibility, we strong amend, strongly recommend that the homeowner follow the lead safe work practices. And I'm gonna talk about what those lead safe practices are now, and you'll see that a lot of them are just common sense. So performing work in a lead safe manner that complies with the renovation rule requirements is relatively simple. And as I mentioned, a lot of it is just common sense. First, the easiest and safest practice is to assume upfront that the paint in a pre-1978 home, apartment, or child occupied facility contains lead. Otherwise, renovators may test for lead-based paint using an EPA approved test kit. Currently, there are two different EPA approved test kits which can be used uh, and they can be found at some retail stores or purchased online. They are called lead check and D-lead test. The next step is to define the work area. This helps determine how much and what type of other protective measures should be taken, such as what openings or materials to cover. Workers should protect building occupants and themselves from lead exposure by using proper containment and lead safe work practices. The main lead safe work practices which should be used at any project involving lead-based paint are listed on this slide. For example, plastic is used to isolate the work area and to cover and protect belongings. This includes covering doorways or setting up a plastic wall. An example of a contained doorway, still allowing someone to use the doorway, is pictured on this slide. In summary, they first cover the entire doorway with plastic, then they cut a slit in the middle of the plastic sheet, which they will use to enter and uh, exit the room, and then they add another sheet of plastic as a flap over that doorway. So the flap will still make sure that the, there's no dust getting through the slit that was cut in that centerpiece while the work is going on. I do want to emphasize that 
plastic should be used for covering and containment and not using a cloth. The dust can be so small that it can actually pass through cloths or other type of cloth sheets. For exterior renovations, the plastic should extend on the ground for 10 feet from the work wall or the surface being worked on. It should extend further to capture any paint chips if that warrants, for example, if, there's, if it's a windy situation. These things are covered in more detail in the training course the worker must attend to get their certification. Lead safe work practices also includes minimizing dust by wet scraping, containing, containing and properly disposing of all waste and debris, and daily cleanup of the work area. Any vacuum used to collect the dust should be one with a high efficiency particulate air or HEPA, H-E-P-A filter. This is a special vacuum and filter. Some shop vacs or, or vacuums advertised as shop vacs, uh, including uh, being advertised as HEPA vacuums, actually don't meet the standards in the renovation or RRP rule. So the HEPA vacuums, HEPA vacuums and filters required under the RRP or renovation rule are specific and are designed to remove particles at a size of 0.3 microns or greater at a 99.7% efficiency. 0.3 microns is about one one hundred thousandths of an inch. Some of these vacuums that are advertised by, by general stores as HEPA vacuums would not have that level of efficiency. So it's important that uh, uh, the proper HEPA vacuum is being used. The cleaning of the work area after the renovation is done can be done with a damp rag or mop. The disposal of the waste that was generated during the renovation can be done according to local codes. So this is another area where a local building department's knowledge can help in identifying what codes must be followed for disposing of the waste generated during the renovation activity. And then once the renovation work is completed, the renovators must perform a cleaning verification. There are specific protocol for cleaning verification, which the contractors must use and they learned this during the eight hour training course. In summary, the cleaning verification is done by using a dry swifter cloth, wiping the cloth over a specified area such as 40 square feet of the floor in the work area, and then conducting a visual comparison test of that cloth to a standard, which has a photograph of a clean and dirty cloth. The standard used for the comparison test is provided by EPA through the training programs. If the cloth fails the cleaning comparison test, then the, the cleaning must be repeated a second and possibly a third time until it meets that uh, standard and, and passes the test. The renovation or RRP rule also prohibits certain work practices, mainly those that could create significant amount of dust or volatilization of lead. They are listed on this slide and they include dry scraping, using heat guns which operate at temperatures over 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit, using open flames or using power machines. However, some of the general practices may sp still be used in certain situations. For example, dry scraping can be done on small jobs. A heat gun can be used if it operates at less than 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. And power sanding can be used if it is attached to a proper HEPA exhaust control system. Now I'm going to talk about ways in which a building department can help prevent exposures to lead. There are actually many ways building departments can help educate renovators from the very basic to the more involved. For example, a simple way to educate people is to post renovation or RRP information on your office's website. 
Another simple way is to have renovation or RRP outreach material available for distribution in your office. Including references to the renovation or RRP rule or requirements or a warning about lead hazards on building permit applications is another way to incorporate RRP information and get that to the contractors and homeowners. A more involved way would be to require contractors working in pre-1978 housing to show proof that of their RRP or renovator certification by providing either their firm certification number or submitting a copy of their EPA for firm certification form when applying for a building permit. Building permit departments can also report tips and complaints to EPA if they become aware of potential violations of the federal renovation or RRP rules. However, we want to point out that building departments are not expected and we are not asking you to determine if any enforceable violation of the EPA rule has occurred. Nor are we suggesting or asking for a building department to conduct an inspection on behalf of, e of EPA. Local governments such as counties and municipalities can also adopt local ordinances requiring renovation or RRP certification for renovations in pre-1978 housing. There could be general language such as a stipulation that the renovation or RRP regulations be followed, including proper certification and the use of appropriate work practices, or specific lead safe requirements could be adopted into a local ordinance, so long as they are at least as protective as the federal rules. An example of a code or legislation at a local level is that which was done by the city of Chicago. The city of Chicago took a proactive approach to preventing lead poisoning. On May 8th of 2013, the Chicago City Council passed a lead safe renovation ordinance promoting the proper handling of lead based paint during renovation. This slide shows a relevant portion of the city's RRP related ordinance. This ordinance requires that building permit applications sign a statement certifying that they will comply with the federal lead safe training requirements and follow lead safe work practices when performing work in target housing. The certification, in May is, certification is made using a form that is on one of the following slides. Another way to get the word out about the renovation or RRP rule requirements and the importance of lead safety is to provide information on the building permit application form itself. One example of this would be to include a lead warning on the application, which also refers to the federal RRP or renovation rule requirements. Another example would be to provide a signature box on the application where the contractor acknowledges his or her awareness of the federal RRP or renovation regulations and the requirement for EPA certification. A building department can also go a step further by actually requiring the contractor's RRP or renovation certification number to be enter entered on the application form. I previously mentioned that the city of Chicago put in place an ordinance on lead based paint renovation. The form on this slide is the example from the city of Chicago, and it was developed as part of their lead safe renovation ordinance. The Chicago form requests detailed information about the housing being worked on, as well as the, as well as the certification status of those who will be working on the property. There is also a sworn statement that certification requirements and proper work practice standards will be followed. You may be able to include this information on an application form without language in an ordinance, although that is something you would have to check on within your city or town. I previously mentioned that you could have copies of lead information available in your office or lobby. Here are some examples. 
All of EPA's renovation or RRP publications are available online in printable format, or they, they can be directly handed out in hard copy. Uh, this includes the Renovate Right pamphlet, which is the one on the left. Under a different part of the lead rules, contractors must give this pamphlet to homeowners and renters prior to any renovation project. The Renovate Right pamphlet is geared toward homeowners and tenants. It describes the dangers of lead poisoning and, why they can ex and what they can expect from contractors performing lead safe work practices. It must be provided to homeowners before a job starts. So it is important that contractors have access to the Renovate Right pamphlet in particular, because if they don't hand out this pamphlet to the occupant prior to starting work, they can be considered to be in violation of the federal RRP or renovation regulations. The middle booklet called Steps to Lead Safe Renovation, Repair and Painting is mainly for contractors and do-it-yourselfers. It explains how to plan for and how to complete a home renovation, repair, or painting project in pre-1978 housing or child-occupied facilities using lead safe work practices. The booklet on the right, the Small Entity Compliance Guide, is for smaller companies, including independent contractors. It discusses the renovation or RRP rule requirements in the most detail. Contractors can access these EPA informational booklets either through links posted on your website or by picking up hard copies at the counter when they come in for their permit applications. And they can provide your office with copies of these booklets. I'm, I'm sorry, and EPA can provide your office with copies of these booklets. Another simple thing a building department can do is to put general information or a warning on your website regarding lead hazards and the renovation or RRP rule. And building permit departments can insert a link on their web pages to EPA's lead website, where there is a lot more information about the renovation or RRP program. EPA's website contains information such as the rule requirements, a searchable frequently asked questions database, and dow downloadable publications such as the Renovate Right pamphlet. Other resources are also available on the website, such as a list of EPA lead safe or RRP certified firms, a list of EPA approved RRP training course providers, the application for firm certification, and contact information for the National Lead Hotline. Information about EPA enforcement cases related to the RRP or renovation program is also available on the EPA website. The website address is included on one of the last slides. I now want to talk about several things that EPA is doing or can do. First, I want to talk about compliance. Simply having a regulation that provides for lead safety is no guarantee that contractors will abide by it. So EPA must also take various steps to see that these requirements are being followed. Some of these steps are noted in the first three bullets on this slide. Uh, EPA staff respond to tips and complaints. The follow-up may be in the form of a site inspection or a follow-up phone call. EPA also performs compliance inspections at work sites in all of those states where EPA is directly responsible for administering the renovation program. Here in EPA Region 5, this includes the states of Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, and Ohio. Wisconsin has its own authorized RRP program, which is similar to the federal program. Because of this, the state of Wisconsin performs all of the compliance monitoring and enforcement functions within that state. If a firm is found to be in violation, EPA may suspend, revoke, or modify a firm's RRP or renovation certification. Violations by individuals and firms can also lead to civil penalties 
of up to $37,500 per violation per day. However, what we're really looking for is compliance and not enforcement. So we are always seeking new ways to become more proactive and effective in educating people about the renovation or RRP rule and for keeping contractors on, on the right path. The last four bullets on this slide include things EPA can do working with you to promote compliance and prevent exposures to lead. Some of these things I talked about earlier, such as providing information to contractors and homeowners. But also EPA can provide general training on RRP or renovation regulations and program for your staff, such as this webinar. EPA can also review language, such as for websites, uh, building permit guides, frequently asked question sheets or fact sheets or applications or codes or ordinances. Uh, we can also discuss lead issues with any other city officials, such as your council or management. Overall, I'd like to thank you for showing an interest in preventing lead poisoning. The affected community is very large. According to the latest census data, there were about 38 million homes in the United States which were built before 1978. To address lead poisoning completely and finally, we need to work together. And we can achieve more in protecting and serving the public and the communities in which we live or work by working together. We've used this presentation to review some of the things EPA is doing, some of the things permitting officers offices have done and some things a permitting office can do. EPA is here to help you to incorporate the renovation or RRP rule requirements into your permitting process. This slide show, shows some of the contacts for additional information on the federal lead-based paint renovation or RRP programs and regulations. If you have any questions on this presentation, or the renovation or RRP program or rule, you can contact me, Tony Martig, or Mary Ann Swirl, and her information was provided earlier and will be later. Also, if you would like to discuss ways in which you, you can incorporate some of the suggestions we reviewed today into your permitting process, or would like to take us up on any of the offers for assistance we mentioned in this presentation, such as providing you with outreach material, uh, please contact me Tony Martig. I would very much like to hear from you. Now I'd also like to have a check in and review some of the items that I talked about and ask you some questions as well. Uh, you can also, as we go through these questions, these check in questions, you can also pause the video uh, while you make notes or think about what the answers to the questions are. So first of all, the first question is, Check all of the following that apply to the RRP rule. So you have uh, the RRP rule addresses lead-based paint hazards created by renovation, repair, and painting activities that disturb lead-based paint uh, in A, pre-1978 target housing and child-occupied facilities, B, only those known to contain lead paint, C, minimum thresholds where there's less uh, greater than uh, six square feet room per room for interior work or greater than 20 square feet for exterior work. D, when more than four windows are being replaced. Or E, it does not include lead paint abatement. Okay, and the answer is, so A was true. The, the RRP rule does apply to pre target housing and child occupied facilities, those facilities that were built prior to 1978. Uh, B was false. Uh, the RRP rule does not only apply to those facilities known to contain lead-based paint. It also applies to the target housing and child occupied facilities that are assumed to contain lead-based paint. In other words, if there's no information 
that there is that there is no lead-based paint at that premise, then you must assume that the home or dwelling, uh, the target housing and child-occupied facility does contain lead-based paint, and therefore the RRP rule applies. C was true. There are minimum thresholds for the applying the RRP rule. It has to be the work has to be involved disturbing greater than six square feet per room for interior work or greater than or equal to six square feet for exterior work. D was false. Uh, the RRP rule applies to any window replacement. So even if there's one in a home, the RRP or renovation rule does apply. And that means that the contractor must be certified and the workers must be trained and certified. And then E was true. Uh, the RRP rule does not apply to a project that falls under the lead-based paint abatement requirements. So here's the next question. Can you identify some ways in which building departments can help promote, promote RRP and use of lead safe work practices in their communities? You should be able to come up with at least three or four different ways. Okay, and here's, uh, here's several different ways which I've reviewed uh, in the previous slides. Building departments can include RRP requirements in their codes. This would be the most effective way for a building a, a community, a building department and the local community to assure compliance with lead safe work practices. A building department can include RRP information on its applications and registration forms. This also brings it to the attention of the contractor that they must be following the federal RRP requirements. Uh, the building departments can have RRP information in the building permit office and we can supply some of that information for you, the pamphlets and booklets that I mentioned on previous slides. A building department can post RRP information on its website or in newsletters, including links to EPA's website. And a building department can report tips and complaints to EPA when they believe or think that there has been a non-compliance with the, the federal RRP requirements or the use of lead safe work practices. Okay, the third question is, which of the following are lead safe work practice requirements for safe renovation? Okay. All right. So if you said all of the above, that was not correct. So you can see which ones are part of the lead safe work practice requirements. Safely setting up work prac or work site and containment with plastic sheeting is is uh, part of the requirements. Wet scraping and sanding is one of the uh, work practice procedures that are allowed. Using heat guns with but operating at a temperature of 1100 degrees Fahrenheit or more is not allowed. That's a prohibited practice. And the last uh, D is also true that completing the work with a cleaning verification or cleaning procedures is also a specific requirement under the lead safe work practices regulations. Okay, I wanna thank you all again for your your participation and listening to Marianne and myself talk about the hazards of lead and the lead safe work practices and emphasizing the importance of working together or working in a lead safe manner. The work you do will have an even greater impact on the health and well-being of children in your home and community uh, as it follows the lead safe renovation and lead safe work practice requirements. Uh, Marianne, Swero's contact information is provided on this slide as well as my contact information. If you have any questions regarding this presentation or any of the material in this presentation, feel free to contact Marianne or myself. Again, I want to thank you for your attention and good luck and goodbye. <laughs>